Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday morning at First Methodist Houston. I am so glad that you are with us. If you are new to us or don't know me, my name is Andy Nixon. I am one of the pastors at First Methodist, and it's great to have you with us online in worship on Sunday morning. Uh, I know uh, it is a little bit different to be uh, in my apartment in this case uh, it, than uh, where we're used to being. I actually tried, believe it or not, to film this sermon in the sanctuary downtown, uh, but the lighting uh, there is all from the top, and so it casts shadows, and it makes your pastors look like grim reapers uh, online. So I went for this look today, but we'll try to get back uh, to there soon. Um, but today, uh, our scripture is John 14, 25 through 27. So I'm going to pray for us, invite you to pray with me, and uh, let's see what God's word has to say to us today. Pray with me. Lord, we ask for your blessings upon this day in what continues to be a very trying season for all of us. We pray this day uh, for those who are sick. We pray for those who are grieving. Uh, we pray uh, for those who just feel lost in the midst of great stress. And maybe it's, maybe it's health, maybe it's job, maybe it's school. Just every part of our life has been disrupted by this uh, terrible disease. So we pray for all of us and that ask that you would lift us up so that we might lean on the strength that faith is and prevail because you are a God that sees us through every wilderness and in you we put our complete faith and trust. Be with us as we read your word and may your blessings be upon it. All God's people say, amen. So we're in the Gospel of John today, chapter 14, 25 through 27. Jesus is speaking. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. These chapters of the Gospel of John are extraordinarily unique. Um, when we talk about how the Gospels sort of came together, how the Gospel of John came to be the Gospel of John, one of the things that you can sort of see when you step back and take a look at the Gospels is that certain chapters, which of course we've added the chapters and the verses, those were not in the original, um, but have, they, they have clusters, and they have themes. And so uh, for these chapters, John 13 uh, is the um, is the foot washing story uh, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus uh, washes the disciples' feet, and then 14, 15, 16 begin to make this transition, where the general theme is how will the disciples, how will Christians follow Jesus when He is not physically there? Now, of course, you know in the resurrection He will appear from time to time, but how will the church be the church? when the leader isn't there. And it's in the middle of this sort of, you know, crisis management of the Gospels, if you will, that Jesus says these powerful lines, which if you've uh, attended church for a while, or you've been, grew up in vacation Bible school, you've heard. Uh, often we say them in funeral settings. But, uh, you know, Jesus is trying to comfort his church. All this I've spoken with, st uh, you know, while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him my name and will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. This is reassurance for the church in that, you know, the disciples, when they were following Jesus, were not writing these things down. Now, when I get to heaven, okay, granted assumption, when we get to heaven, um, we can ask, but I'm skeptical because paper, precious commodity and expensive. And so, uh, you know, Jesus would have relied on or the disciples would have relied on sort of people remembering the stories. This is why I think Jesus talked in parables. Part of it is to make a point, part of it is to tell a story, but part of it too is it's so much easier to remember a story. And so Jesus used that so that we might remember what it is that he said. And so these words of Jesus are meant to be a reassurance that after Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit's going to be sent and people will be reminded of all that Jesus said. He's, he's essentially saying, don't worry. God is going to take you care of you in the future, just as I have taken care of you now, and God has taken care of us in the past. 
And it's here I, I kind of want to pause because we talked about this at the Thursday uh, afternoon uh, Bible study on the First Methodist Houston Facebook page. Is that I, I find, you, you know, our, our faith as, as, as it works practically uh, kind of moves along three fronts in the sense that we, uh, we remember what God has done in the past, the traditions of the church, uh, the way we grew up, what our grandparents uh, said to us and what they did. Uh, we remember the present, which is what is God asking of me today? What does Jesus need of me uh, this morning, this day, this time? Okay. And then our faith has a future dynamic in that I trust and believe that God is going to be with me in the days that are ahead. And I have optimism. I have confidence. I know that just as God has been with me in the past and present, God will be with me in the future. Now, a strong faith, in my opinion, holds on to all three of those and doesn't use one at the expense of the other. Here's what I mean. Sometimes we look to the past and we idolize the past and we are grateful for the past, but too much so. And it's like, why couldn't it always be or why couldn't it be in the past like it once was? And there's some nostalgia there. I understand that. The older I get, the more I look back and uh, I uh, uh, can't wonder if all this progress is really uh, progress at all. I was talking with my kids the other day and telling them that I remember when televisions uh, had knobs and you had to actually go to the television, turn it on, and you had three choices as to which channel uh, you wanted to watch. And now, I mean, we have hundreds of channels and the irony is with nothing to watch. Um, with sports being gone, we are reduced uh, to watching cornhole. And um, if, if, well, this is just sad and confessional, isn't it? Yes, I have watched a cornhole tournament uh, during this pandemic. <laughs> out of sheer and utter boredom. Uh, maybe we just need to pause so I can confess that sin right now. But, uh, it, you know, we look to the past, but we can't idolize it. And, and to the extent that it costs us the faith of our present and future. In the same time, sometimes Christians have been tempted, we see this in scripture, to think about the future exclusively, usually when the church is persecuted. And, and we think that God is going to come in some great victory and, 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 and smash our enemies. Revelations kind of talks about this. Daniel talks about this from time to time. And while I think it's true that God provides us every victory in the future and overcomes any opposition and enemies uh, to his will, I also think that when Jesus returns and how God does what God does, that's up to God. And so I can't get so focused on the future that I dismiss or forget about my responsibilities to be a faithful Christian today. Jesus, to me, wanted to kind of keep us focused in the here and now. You might remember the story of when uh, Jesus comes and sees the woman at the well, and she's apparently had a, a, a tumultuous pers personal life. She's been married to, to seven guys, all of whom are related brothers. And, and, and his opponents come in when they want to trap him and say, you know, in heaven, whose wife is she? And, and Jesus essentially, I'll let you look at it for yourself, but dodges the question. And to say, you're asking things about what you don't understand. And if we were focused on loving God and loving neighbor right here, right now, if you do that today, the future will take care of itself. So Jesus, to get back to our John passage, is offering some reassurance to his disciples and thereby to us, the church, to say, stay focused. Stay focused on what the Holy Spirit is asking of you here and now. And if we do that, we will get through the crisis we are in. All this I have spoken while still with you, Jesus said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus will be with us in the here and now. And even though events may get tough, the difficulty of those events never eclipses the power and the strength of God and faith. You see, Jesus speaks these words at an unbelievable turning point in his ministry, and that just after kind of this, this 14, 15, 16 unit of, of the Gospel of John, the, the events that lead to Jesus' arrest, torture, uh, crucifixion, death, uh, begin to unfold. And so the disciples are going to be in a time where they are afraid, and their leader is no more. 
And we might want to pause and, and think about this because we too right now are in a trying time. And we might ask, where, where is Jesus in the midst of all this suffering? And, um, you know, the other day I mentioned this on a, on a devotional. It's like I went to get my haircut. It was sort of my first outing uh, to kind of do a normal kind of thing other than the grocery store. And uh, uh, it, was re- it was just bizarre. I go to the front door and there, there's a sign that says, do not touch the door, do not touch the handle. And so the, the way you got in is I got the attention of, of, the, of the people inside and he immediately comes out and says hello. And he's in a mask. Of course, I'm in a mask. And, and, um, and, and then he's got a big bottle of hand sanitizer and he puts it in my hand and wash the hands. And, and then we go in and everybody's in masks in this barbershop getting a haircut. And it's just, it looks all so normal but it's also also wrong and that it's just not how it used to be and the disciples are in an exponentially worse version of the same dynamic in that when their leader goes down when he's arrested when he's tortured and they would have heard about this jerusalem i mean it's a city but not by our standards this is this is this is a pretty small place as they hear what is happening to him, they hear about his trial. It is going to be very easy for them to crater. In fact, Peter does, denying that he even knows Jesus three times. So Jesus is trying to put this strong word of confidence into his followers because he knows how difficult the situation is about to be. And he does not want this early, early church to collapse in the midst of this great weight and trial that it's about to be under. Now, here we might want to pause because we're in a somewhat similar time and we know the same dynamic. Um, it's not to this scale in our lives, perhaps, but you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a student of the Civil War, as you may know, and, and I actually went to Washington and Lee University uh, to do my undergraduate work, and it's just uh, the Civil War and I have, have, <laughs> have spent a lot of time together. And um, there, there are many stories, because the Civil War in 1861, 1865, it started off sort of as a European war, a traditional one, but then it became really a precursor to almost World War I, trench warfare. And it was brutal. It was just brutal. Uh, the weapons were crude, and, and the suffering was just horrid. Uh, the state of Mississippi, uh, right after the war, spent half of its budget on artificial limbs because so many of its, uh, of its citizens were maimed by this, this horrible conflict. But there are all sorts of stories, though, of leading the charge over the trench in a variety of battles, and all of a sudden something happens, and the leader of the unit, the leader of the, the brigade, the leader goes down, shot, wounded, killed, and all of a sudden the rest of the troop, it's just a wave of fear overcomes them and they just fall back retreat running far back you know behind their original lines over and over i mean there's just countless stories of civil war battles like this because when a leader does go down it affects the rest of us if you've been on a sports team and maybe you know the person who's the best athlete of your bunch uh, they're injured and all of a sudden they're on the bench they're not where they're supposed to be it sends a little bit of a shock wave through the whole team and the question becomes are you, am I, are we going to step up? And are we even capable of stepping up in such a way that replaces the one that we have lost, albeit maybe temporarily? It's a tough thing when the person that we look to to lead goes down. And so Jesus is speaking to this dynamic among his team. And he's saying, he's saying to them a couple of things. Uh, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of the suffering that he's about to undergo, he says this, and starting in verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He wants his people, he wants his followers to be at ease, even in the midst of unbelievable suffering and fear, he wants his people to be at ease. Peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Then he says this, I do not give to you as the world gives. This is typical Jesus. And, and, and this is one of those phrases where it, it, he's, he's inviting us to ask a second question almost. I do not give to you as the world gives. Well, then how do you give to us? And I think he wants us to find the answer in what 
he's saying, I think here is, I do not give to you as the world gives because anything the world gives us is going to fade, it's going to tarnish, it's going to pass away. It, it, it's as if, you know, I, I eat a meal, but then I'm only going to be hungry uh, hours again later, certainly the next day. And, and so what Jesus gives to us, he's alluding to here, I think is permanence. And so peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. In other words, this peace that he offers us is something that can withstand any trial. And then he says this in the last line, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Powerful, encouragement, strength, conviction that we as Christians have. Again, not by our own merit, but we have these things because the Holy Spirit comes from God and gives us to him. And so here's kind of a, a second question for us to consider. I talked about how our, our faith kind of has a dynamic of the past, the present, the future. And I think as, as good Methodist Christians, we hold on to all three of those because they all three have power and strength and we don't use one at the expense of the other. But also, you know, we talk about God in a, in a Trinitarian kind of way. We say Father, Son, and Spirit. And sometimes I find uh, that God the Father, we get, we've all had a father figure in our lives, so that comes naturally to us. God the Son, we understand, because we read about Jesus in the Gospels. He's a person, he's a, he's a, he's a character, he's a man, it's somebody we can hold on to. He lived, he, he spoke, he taught, um, and so we, can, we can't grasp that. But then this Holy Spirit, mm, maybe that's a little difficult for us. I don't know. And I, I would encourage you, if you've not kind of delved into the Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe it's time. Sometimes, you know, I try to translate it into a little bit different language, because especially for people who didn't grow up in the church, the Holy Spirit kind of sounds like a strange phrase. And sometimes I call it, it's God in real time. And that, you know, God, Christ is going to show up. He's resurrected. The Spirit is going to move. And so we should see and we should feel and we should know that God is with us and we should uh, look for opportunities for God to call us and to represent the gospel uh, in, in every single moment. And when we do that, I think what we're becoming is a spirit-filled Christian. So Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is going to be sent by God the Father. And one of the fruits of that will be an, a feeling of certainty and peace that overcomes fear. Now to say a little bit more maybe about that. I don't think Jesus is saying that we will never feel afraid. You know, as the disciples go through the events of, of Calvary, the crucifixion and death of Jesus, I think they certainly felt the fear. But you have to ask yourself a question. Is the fear going to prevail? Is the fear going to win? Am I going to be so concerned about uh, what might happen that I'm going to let that prohibit me from being a faithful Christian today. And that's the line I think that Jesus is trying to draw. We're going to feel the fear. We're going to feel afraid. We're going to see things that disturb us and make us feel highly uncomfortable. But yet we cannot let those emotions override the convictions that faith brings. And that faith is stronger than fear. And we should feel that in the peace that we have in our hearts in the midst of a very difficult storm. I probably don't need to do a whole lot of preaching to kind of say this, how this might apply to us today, uh, because we are all in a storm. And uh, I've said this before because I think it's the best line uh, I've heard to kind of describe our time, no matter how we've been affected by the virus. And uh, we've had a couple of our folks at First Methodist who've gotten sick by it. Uh, we've had one that passed away. Uh, because of it. But, um, and so in, in that regards, numerically, our congregation has not, you know, it's, it's just we haven't seen a whole lot of the disease, praise be to God. But even if I'm somebody who's not gotten sick, my whole life has been touched by this. Uh, you know, my kids, my, my kids in school, uh, my job, uh, the, the, the places that I go, all of our life has just been a bit of a whirlwind and where we, we used to have walked with clarity and known uh, what we would probably do on any given day, all of a sudden we have found ourselves shut in, literally. And, uh, and that's disturbing. Every single part of our life ha has been somewhat touched by chaos. And yet Jesus speaks to moments like this when he says he gives us peace 
So even though we feel the storm, we don't let the storm become us. And then he gives us this great line, which I think is just flat worth memorizing. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. I would hope that maybe you and I would memorize that verse today. Because if you and I were to repeat it at the right time, then I think that could greatly draw us closer to Christ and give us the strength we need. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. You and I at some point have to make a decision as to whether or not, uh, you know, what is evil, uh, what is broken, what is sinful is going to rule our hearts. And the answer has to be no, it can't. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And so maybe uh, we step out and maybe we uh, say, you know what, uh, we're going to find a way uh, to make it through us. We may not know exactly what that way is, but we're going to make it and we are going to win. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Uh, I have to say, just, just in all candor, there have not have been a lot of times uh, that I've felt fear. Um, there have been a few. Uh, I remember when I lived in New England, uh, you would uh, go driving in the winter and you'd be in a snowstorm and you'd hit a patch of ice. And then all of a sudden uh, you'd find yourself uh, headed in a direction that you did not choose to go. And, and uh, all there is is a chance to react and, and pray that God somehow uh, straightened your course. And sometimes that happens. And so a couple of times I ended up in the ditch. But the difference between a situation like that and the one we're in is, is the length of time. And that this is, what, almost been three months? And, and yet, um, I think it's important for us to remit, repeat to ourselves, maybe on a daily basis, maybe on an hourly basis, just how true this is. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And what we're saying is we're letting the peace of Christ be stronger than the fear. So my prayer is that's true for you today, and it's true for me. Because as we do, um, I think that can just bring us great comfort in the sense that God is with us, and even though the storm is coming and we're in the middle of it, we will prevail. Uh, Jesus told the parable of the wise and foolish builder. The wise builder builds his house upon the rock, and when the storm comes, it stays. Whereas the person who builds it you know, on a lesser foundation, it's washed away. Of course, we want to be the former, the one who builds their house upon the rock. And the way we can do that is by being to the open to the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. Let God move in you in a powerful way so that we feel God's peace. We feel God's love. We feel God's joy. And when we do that, all of a sudden we find our heart is not disturbed at all, but calm. And we are not afraid. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the gift of this time together in your word. We pray that it would take root in our hearts, because this is not ink on a page. It is meant to be incorporated into us so that we might live fully and completely in your name. We thank you for the gift that you are, Jesus, and ask that you would continue to speak to us. Help us to know that you want to reach out to us in real time and be with us, to give us a word, show us the way, so that we might know you are right by our side. Thank you.